an interesting talk on limb salvage in the developing world by Dr. Stephanie Wu, who's a dean of the William Shaw College of Podiatry Medicine and a professor for professor in the Center for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine, North Southern Franklin University of Medicine, United States. And she's going to talk to us on limb salvage, tips to limb, to, tip, tips to preserve the limb in the developing world. So Dr. Stephanie, we welcome you on behalf of the Foot International. And we have Professor Mahimuna and Dr. Simon, who has joined us. They are our regional council members. So on to you, Stephanie. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I will share my screen. Okay, now it is. So hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. And first, I do not have anything to disclose with respect to this talk. So just to provide everyone an overview, we will start by talking about the current state of play when it comes to diabetic limb salvage and the diabetic foot. And then we'll talk about treatment strategies for optimal healing with an emphasis on what to look at, some tips for the developing world. Um, when we talk about that, we'll focus on three things. Number one is what can we take off the wound in terms of debridement and offloading? Oftentimes you'll hear that it's actually not what we put on the wound, but rather what we take off the wound in terms of these necrotic cells and, and to, to create an acute wound and in terms of offloading to truly make it heal. And then we'll talk about what can we put on the wound in terms of moist wound healing and moisture balance. And then finally, we'll end with what can we do to prevent recurrence. So that's talk about the state, um, the current state. So currently, by the latest data, 537 million adults aged 20 to 79 years worldwide suffer from diabetes. And it's projected to rise by about 11% to 643 million by the year 2030, which isn't that far away, and to 783 million by the year 2025. Uh, you can, and you it's can been see said that the risk of developing foot ulcers in patients with diabetes is around 25%. So by doing the math, we can imagine all the people who are going to suffer from the diabetic foot. Moreover, in looking at the biggest risk factor for the diabetic foot ulcer, it's a history of a previous ulcer. So when looking at the high reoccurrence rate, along with the prevalence of diabetes that's expected to increase worldwide, this is a devastating disease that, that is pandemic. Slide. Can you all see full screen now? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Yeah, yeah my, my apologies. I, I, I did not know that. So to provide everyone with an overview, we will first start by talking about the current state of play. And then we'll talk about treatment strategies for optimal healing with an emphasis on tips, especially in those of the developing world. In term, when we look at treatment strategies, I like to look at it in three simple questions. What can we take off the wound in terms of debridement and offloading? What can we put on the wound? And then um, in terms of moist wound healing, and what can we do to prevent recurrence? So let's talk about the current state of play. Based on the latest data, 537 million adults worldwide aged 20 to 79 years suffer from diabetes. The number is projected to rise by about 11% to 643 million by 2030. And by the year 2045, it's expected to grow even further to 783 million. Now, it's been said that the risk for developing foot ulcers in patients with diabetes is about 25%. 
So by doing the math, it's easy to see the number of people who are going to be affected by the diabetic foot. Moreover, when we look at the risk factors for developing a diabetic foot ulcer, the biggest risk factor is a history of a previous ulcer. So given the high reoccurrence rate, the increasing prevalence of diabetes worldwide, we know that this will continue to be a problem for, for us as we handle more and more patients with the diabetic foot. Now, for patients with either a diabetic foot ulcer or a diabetic foot infection, they're at 3.4 times greater odds for hospital, for, for emergency room admissions, and are at 6.7 times higher odds for hospital admissions. So this is a graph that was um, published back in 2013. And in this graph, which many of you have seen previously, we can see that for people with diabetes who've had the high, meaning below knee and higher amputation, they're at their five-year mortality rate is at about 68%. And you can see from the graph here, it's actually much higher than most of the cancers out there with the exception of lung cancer. Now, in more recent data that was published in 2017, the mortality rate after diabetes-related amputations, again, higher amputations from the um, below knee onwards, it's actually at greater than 70% for all patients with diabetes. And in looking specifically at those who are receiving renal replacement therapy, the mortality rate at two years is even higher at 74%. And in looking at the risk of death at five years, it's two and a half times higher for patients with a diabetic foot ulcer than a patient with diabetes without a foot ulcer. So this graph depicts the global annual cost of wound care. So back in 2014, it was about $2.8 billion. Last year, it was about $3.5 billion. This year, you can see that it jumped significantly to $15 billion. And the reason for that is the development of these newer technology involved smarter dressings, along with many of the bioengineered products that is currently available for wound care. And in looking at two years from now, 2024, it's estimated to go even higher to about $22 billion. However, this global estimated cost of wound care is for all wounds, including pressure ulcers, venous leg ulcers. But in looking specifically at the diabetic foot and the management of it, along with its complications, the diabetic foot is related to the, it's the most expensive to treat due to the high economic burden on the health system. Now, it's been said that a diabetic amputation takes place every 30 seconds around the world. And in looking at the data, now this data is specifically from the United States, but you can see here, um, this graph depicts the non-traumatic lower extremity amputations among adults with diabetes. And you can see by the graph here that it, tempts, it was dipping down to maybe about 20, 2009, and then it's starting to dip up again. Now, what's interesting is the authors actually broke down the types of amputations into different levels. So blue depicts toe amputations, red depicts the foot amputation, green depicts knee or below knee amputation, and purple depicts above knee amputation. And in looking at the data, the authors found that the increase in amputations from 2009 onwards were most pronounced in young people, specifically age 18 to 44 years old, as well as the middle age from 45 to 64 years old, again, correlating well with this increased prevalence in diabetes that we're seeing worldwide. They also saw an increased number of amputations in men versus women, 
And then in looking specifically, so I drew an arbitrary line here from 2009 onwards, so we can see the trend. So you can see the trending that's going up. But in looking more at these blocks, right, that, that identify the specific levels of amputation, we can see that there's an increase in minor amputations, specifically of the toe amputations. And this was attributed to a shift in the decision making, where many of of the providers were feeling that by providing or by giving these patients toe amputations, it will prevent higher level amputations later on. Now, when we talk about diabetic foot management, our goal is to revert the wound healing progression so we can maximize the maximum healing potential. The first thing that we must do when we look at the diabetic foot is address infection and ischemia. If, if these two are present, we must in, in, ensure that they're addressed first. And if, say, they're both present, then we look at which one is more predominant, which one is more at risk for the patient losing their limb and their life, and address that first. Once we've addressed both infection and ischemia, then the goal is to convert the deep wounds, those that extend to muscle, bone, joint, and convert them into a superficial wound. And then once we've got superficial wounds, our next step is to manage the wound bed status so that it progresses from these fibrinous necrotic wounds to these granular wounds. And then finally, employ debridement to restore these chronic wounds and make them into acute wounds. Now, one of the ways to do that, um, when we're talking about non-infected, non-ischemic wounds, um, the way I look at it is to ask three practical questions. What can we take off the wound that's going to enhance healing? Number two, what can we put on the wound that's going to further healing? And number three, how can we uh, prevent reoccurrence? Now, let's take a look at question number one. What can we take off the wound to make it heal? Hopefully, my videos will, will play. But you can see from the two videos here, the two things that we must take off the wound is, number one, the removal of the necrotic tissue. In other words, debridement. And then you can see from the bottom movie clip here, uh, which actually depicts the stress that is on the foot as the patient takes a step, is really the trauma or the stress that is imposed on the foot when the patient is ambulating. Now, these two items, debridement and offloading, are really two of the important cornerstones of, of wound care, of, of diabetic foot healing. And this is a point where we can't really emphasize enough because it's often been said that it's not what you put on the wound, but really what you take off the wound that is more important to, to help with healing. So let's first talk about debridement. When it comes to chronic ulcers, we know that they harbor planktonic bacteria that could potentially lead to either local or systemic infection. And they may also uh, stay on the wound in the form of biofilm. So about 6% of the acute wounds have biofilm, whereas over 90% of chronic wounds harbor biofilm. And we know that it impairs wound healing. Now in this, um, graphic depiction of this wound, of this chronic wound, which can may result from ischemia, hypoxia, multiple factors such as diabetes, the patient's age, smoking, obesity. And, and when, when you've got the chronic wound, we know that microorganisms are all around us. They can easily form this biofilm that may stay, and they're very, very difficult to, to get rid of once they're on the wound. And oftentimes, if there's an increase in bacterial bio burden, we'll notice an increased extrudate from the wound that may actually cause maceration from the wound or the need to change dressings more often. And then if the bacteria actually decide to either go deeper into the wound or uh, start spreading um, horizontally across the wound, we often end up with either um, osteomyelitis or cellulitis for the, for the patient.
So what is biofilm exactly? So know that even though for us, the most common uh, biofilm is bacteria cells, but they can actually be any microbial cells. And these microbial cells, they adhere to either living or non-living surfaces. So yes, we deal with it quite a bit in terms of wounds, but for in the ortho ward, for example, where we put in screws and sometimes joint replacement, biofilm can actually adhere to the non living surfaces of these joint replacement, which becomes um, very much problematic in terms of septic joints. So these microbial cells adhere themselves to the surfaces by producing this matrix of extracellular polymeric substances, or what's called EPS. The way I describe it to patients is essentially these bacteria, or these microbes, are building shelter, just like you and I would build houses to shelter ourselves from the rain and the weather. Well, these microbial cells are doing the same to actually shelter themselves from whatever we're trying to do. And it's actually fairly effective. You can see here the picture of that slime that, that the, these uh, biofilms produce, that they are very tolerant to antimicrobial agents, be it antibiotics or antiseptics. And they can also result in this persistent mild inflammation infection that's just locally at the wound, but they prevent wound healing. Now, it's been shown that biofilms delay wound healing um, by creating the sustained but, you know, ineffective inflammatory process that impairs granulation tissue formation and epithelialization. So you can see here, um, the outline of the biofilms with the neutrophils of the body trying to digest it, but not being very effective. And um, because of the biofilms, the body's then not enabled, it's not able to continue the granulation tissue and the healing process and eventually delays healing. And studies have found that, you know, this one study, for example, they looked at 65 subjects with diabetic foot ulcers. And in looking at these ulcer samples under a scanning electron microscopy, 100% of the samples contained biofilm. And looking at it molecularly, um, the biofilms had presence of both monospecies uh, as well as multi-species. And what's been found is generally the more chronic the wound is, uh, it, the more tendency for it to be a multi-species biofilm. However, they also noted that there's really no clinical correlation that's, uh, that's going to help the clinicians identify the wound biofilm. And indeed, it's extremely difficult to really visualize the biofilm and say, aha, I know exactly this, this got to be biofilm. Now, in, in looking at it clinically, these biofilms, they can be opaque, they're the slimy, this slough-like substance on the surface of the wound. Sometimes they can have a color to them. They can be green or pale yellow, and you can see it on the dressings as well. And what, what's uh, unique about the biofilms is they actually can be removed traumatically fairly easily. However, the problem with them is they reform very, very quickly, and they respond poorly to antimicrobial agents. And then looking at the difference, so this chart depicts the difference between a biofilm and sloth. You can see that the biofilm, the main type of cells is the microbial cells. In our, in our cases, generally it's, it's um, bacterial. And with the sloth, it's skin cells. And in looking at biofilms, they're mainly live because they're viable uh, microbial cells in there. Again, that's their way of kind of building houses in, in essence that's protecting themselves. Whereas with the sloth, it's mainly the dead cells that, that is uh, from, from the skin. The general composition for biofilms, you've got cells, polysaccharides, proteins, DNAs, ions, whereas for sloth, they tend to be cells and proteins. Now, the thing with biofilms is they recur very quickly, whereas the sloth, it, it tends to recur or reform gradually. It takes days for them to do so. For enzymatic treatment, uh, for biofilms, it's essentially ineffective, whereas for the sloth, it actually does help. 
And for the biofilms, they all they may also, and this makes it very difficult to distinguish because it's in the wound, it's going to harbor cells, non-viable cells from the host tissue. So some of the sloth will be in there. And this what the sloth too, because bacteria is all around us, they may include some viable microorganisms and they may even have some biofilms in there. And they, they essentially look the same, which makes it really difficult to distinguish between the two. So here's a guideline that may help identify wound biofilm. You know, it's you can break it down into visual signs as well as the non-visual signs. So by visual signs, you know, we want to ask ourselves, does the surface substance detach easily and atraumatically from the underlying wound bed by using, say, mechanical debridement or some sort of technique to remove it? If the answer is yes, probably it's a wound um, biofilm, whereas if it's no, it may be more likely that it's tied to devitalized tissues such as uh, sloth or fibrin. Question number two, does the surface substance persist despite the use of autolytic or enzymatic debridement? And if the answer is yes, it's more likely to be biofilm. And if it's no, more likely to be sloth or fibrin. And then number three, does that surface substance, they, do they reform quickly in a day or two in the absence of frequent interventions such as cleaning or debridement? If the answer is yes, more likely biofilm. If no, it's probably not. And then for the non-visual signs, we can ask ourselves, does the wound respond poorly to topical or systemic antibiotics? If it's yes, then like more likely to be biofilm. And if it's no, it's probably plantonic bacteria. Uh, question number five, does the wound respond poorly or slowly to dressings that contain antiseptic agents? If the answer is yes, more likely biofilm. If it's no, uh, maybe more plantonic bacteria. And then finally, question number six, does the wound respond favorably to multimodal strategies such as physical debridement, cleaning, topical antimicrobials? If it's yes, more likely biofilm. If it's no, it may be the comorbidity of the patient. So when we talk about debridement, it's in very broad terms. The definition of debridement is the removal of devitalized or necrotic tissue or even foreign bodies from a wound. And to um, optimize debridement, one should achieve a balance between the removal of necrotic tissue and the preservation of healthy tissue and not inhibit subsequent healing. So many um, agree that debridement is really the key initial first step um, by helping remove all of callus and necrotic tissue. Now, one of the ways I look at, one of the, the tips I look at to see whether the patient is offloaded adequately is with the development of callus tissue. So callus tissue actually form uh, because of in reaction to pressure. So if you ever shake the hand of a gardener or even a tennis player or somebody who use their hands a lot, you'll notice that they have a lot of callus on their hands. Same thing with the foot. When we look at the foot at the callus areas, these are signs that tells us that these are areas of higher pressure. So when we offload a patient adequately, we should see minimal callus. So if a patient comes in and we're seeing large or copious amounts of callus, it's an indication to us that, hey, the offloading actually may not be adequate. So when we debride, we must first remove the callus tissue, remove the necrotic tissue. By debridement, it also decreases the bacterial bio burden, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then finally, it helps, debridement helps with the removal of these phenotypically altered cells, or what's called the cellular burden. Now, if I'll direct your attention to this chronic wound here, right, by looking at this wound, at least on the gross level, it does not look infected. We don't see signs of um, infection, the gross signs, right? By urethema, edema. It, it, typically, it looks like a chronic wound. And we know it's a chronic wound because the difference between this wound and this, uh, this part here while we're kind of going in with the blade is, well, the wound actually is not bleeding. 
it's not active, it's chronic. Whereas an acute wound where we're debriding, we're actually causing some bleeding because by that, by the wound bleeding, it actually signals to the body that there is an acute wound here and it's going to attract all these chemokines and cytokines to come help the wound heal. And, you know, these wounds, interestingly, when, when the researchers looked at these wounds via microscope, they actually found that the cells in these chronic wounds were phenotypically altered so that they become senescent or lazy. So, you know, as you can see here, they're just hanging out. Hey, I've got a wound. I don't really care to heal, right? It, it's not infected. It, they, they, it's delayed healing. They don't really care to heal, which is why it's important in addition to everything else that we're doing as part of debridement to remove these phenotypically altered cells, to remove the cellular burden, to convert these chronic wounds into an acute wound. And I just kind of wanted to highlight one of the cases that I saw. I saw this case several years ago, but it actually depicts, you know, a, a biofilm um, forming and how difficult it is to remove. So this patient is a 59-year-old male. It has type 2 diabetes, charcoal, neuroarthropathy, hypercholesterolemia, quit tobacco about five years ago. He smoked 42-pack year history, social drinker, meds. I've got listed here, glycopide, um, metformin. And when we cultured the wound, it grew out pseudomonas and MRSA. And we took both an x-ray and MRI in the this patient did not fortunately end up, um, did not have osteomyelitis. So we saw this patient on October 15th, and um, this is what the wound looked like. And the patient actually called and said, hey, I really need to come in because I think something is going on, something isn't right. So when we saw the patient two, two days later, I think it was on a Wednesday, you can see here that this, this is what the patient came in with. Now, the first thing, of course, that popped in our minds is, uh, we, we think it's biofilm. Again, because it's so difficult to, to distinguish clinically, we're thinking, okay, could be soft, but considering that we just saw the patient two days ago, you know, we're suspecting biofilm. We use mechanical debridement to remove that superficial layer, but you can see, still see some of, uh, some of the underlying biofilm on the wound bed itself. And then we debrided the patient and asked the patient to come back two days later. And this is what the wound looked like. And you can see here that despite us even using antimicrobial, so this is a silver dressing here, despite us using antimicrobial and seeing the patient just two days prior, you can see that the biofilm actually, you know, overwhelmed the dressing and the extra date is um, went into the foam layer. And you can see the biofilm that, that is clearly on the wound surface. So again, mechanical debridement followed by sharp debridement. And then that was on a Friday. So we saw the patient come back on a Monday. Now, at this time, we're recognizing that was biofilm. We taught the patient's family, you need to change the dressing three times a day and you need to debride, you need to use mechanical debridement. In other words, irrigate the wound. We want to decrease the bio burden as much as we can to try to get ahead of the game. And you know, when we saw the patient on the Monday, it looks like, hey, we, we actually made a good turn. It did not, you know, the extra date did not go through the, um, the silver dressing. When we removed it, it looked like, hey, that heavy biofilm may, may be gone. And we initiated again the sharp debridement process and we said, hey, it's Monday. Looks like you're turning the corner. Why don't you come back on the Thursday? And well, despite us, all these efforts, you can see that the biofilm returned again. You can see that it's overwhelming the dressing, again, going over to, to through to the foam dressing layer. And by removing it, you can again see that biofilm that is on the wound itself. So again, we employed uh, mechanical debridement to remove the quantity and disrupt the biofilm, followed by sharp debridement, and then had the patient come back. And then by, no, this is now November 1, and you can see that while the extra date is a little less, it's still um, soaking through the silver dressing. 
And by removing it, what we thought that was kind of interesting at the time is we're starting to notice more of the skin islands that, that is forming here. It is the skin islands that is forming on, on, onto the wound itself. And what's interesting is you can see the biofilm, but however, you could see the dents from the, the skin islands where it did not affect the intact skin. It was truly on the wound bed itself. Here's a close up so you can see that from the islands, skin islands on, uh, for, for the wound. And this is the wound after we perform mechanical debridement and sharp debridement. And, we, and this is a patient on November 12th. So now by now you're thinking, hey, it started around October 15th. So we're going on about a month now and we're still battling the, the spile film. It looks like we may be turning, you know, kind of turning the corner that the patient is um, get, getting better with, with the biofilms. Here's the patient again by the, end of, uh, by the end of November. And you can see that it's not overwhelming the dressing as it used to, but you can still see that layer at the um, at the bottom of the wound base here. And again, we continue to um, do the mechanical along with the sharp debridement. And you can start to see that it the, the wound is actually slowly coming back. You can see on um, the islands uh, getting a little bigger. You can see that the wound looks like it may have turned a corner here. And this is now December 19th. So two months after the biofilm had formed. However, one of the things I really want to emphasize is oftentimes, you know, especially when it comes to debridement, when we provide good wound healing, when we provide good debridement, we're able to really um, over overcome these biofilms that may form in the wound, you can see that the wound itself, without the need to put some fancy dressing on, some expensive dressing that, that may or may not be available, you can see the wound itself actually starting to heal. So not only are we seeing greater islands, we're, we're seeing patches of the epithelialization from, from the wound. Um, by just doing good basic wound care. So now this is in January of, um, so, now, so now we're looking at you know, finishing up October, November. So we're looking at you know, two and a half months now since this biofilm started. And it looks like we're turning the corner. You can see more of the patches of uh, skin epithelialization that is recurring with just by us overcoming the biofilms. And, you know, this is what it looked like in January 14th. Now, unfortunately, this patient actually ended up having a heart attack and passed away. So I do not have follow-up uh, photos, but I really wanted to use this case as an emphasis as yes, when these biofilms develop, they are very, very difficult for us to overcome. And But be patient, be diligent, um, do what we need to do to break down the biofilms to um, over, overcome the bacteria. And once we're able to do that without the need for any additional fancy type of advancement care, the patient actually will start to heal. Now, interestingly with this uh, patient, the, this patient actually had a wound on the right foot as well. Needless to say, given the you know, extent of biofilm formation on the left foot, um, we, we emphasize quite a bit on that. But again, I kind of wanted to emphasize with good wound care what happened with the left foot. So again, this is what the uh, right foot looked like on October 15th. And this is following sharp debridement. And this is uh, what the wound looked like two days later. Do you remember the picture that I showed you of the left foot where it was just overwhelmed with biofilm? What's interesting is it occurred us to a certain extent, but not, not as significantly to the right foot as well. When we cultured it, it grew out the same. And so by doing the mechanical and the sharp debridements, you know, this is what the right foot looked like. And then later on, it looks like while the left foot was getting slightly better, the right foot was actually getting a little a little worse with you know again being overwhelmed with the biofilms you can see it being on the silver dressing it overwhelmed the anti uh, antimicrobial dressing as we would expect it to because of the poor response of biofilms to antimicrobials and you can see it on the wound base here again we employed mechanical debridement um, followed by sharp debridement and this is a patient later on. And my apologies, the dates are up top. I actually can't see it from, from the display here. And you, uh, we debrided it further. 
And again, we saw the patient later. And you know, one thing I really want to emphasize as well is oftentimes when we're dealing with these my, um, microbial bio burden, it's very difficult to look at it clinically and kind of say, aha, uh -huh, this is the point where we turn the corner. This is the point where um, this, you know, what we have to do is really to have faith and continue what we're doing and know that if we continue to be diligent about it, we will eventually break that mold and we will overcome that bacterial bio burden. And so, you know, what I want to emphasize, because this is the patient in January, and you can see that by doing, again, just diligent wound care, by um, doing adequate debridement, you can see the epithelialization, how it's advanced, this, uh, this edge of advancement of epithelialization, demonstrating that by having good um, ad adequate debridement to help um, fight off these bio burden, we're able to help the wound, uh, help the patient. You can see as it advances further. Again, as I mentioned earlier, that unfortunately this patient ended up having a heart attack and passing away, so I don't have follow-up photos. But hopefully this uh, provides an example of the importance and how, how challenging it is of when we're dealing with these biofilms that can form. You know, I've listed on the left here many ways for us to debride, and, you know, the sharp debridement obviously is, I'm going to mute, okay, the sharp debridement, as you can see, is the, the gold standard. Oftentimes, though, it's not one or the other. We employ um, multiple debridement methods in order to help with the patient. Now, in looking at our patient, the one with a biofilm, you know, it's very important, and I emphasize, it's important to really start off with mechanical debridement. And remember, when this patient came in, they've had just significant biofilm that was forming. And we need to initially, in this case, you don't want to jump into, say, sharp debridement right away because we need to break, break up that biofilm. And in addition to that, while we're seeing the patient, you know, we started by seeing this patient three times a week, and then we reduce it down to twice a week and eventually once a week. And we were able to do that is because we taught the patient's family. So here, this is actually a video of the patient's wife performing mechanical debridement. And it was very important important part of the treatment because if that was not done, there was no way we could have really over, overcome that bio burden. So when, whenever the, the wife is changing the dressings, again, we had her change it three times a day. We had her perform the mechanical debridement to break down that bio, biofilm formation. And by doing this, it limited the amount of the biofilm that was able to reform so that we were eventually able to progress as we did. And, you know, of course, when the patient came in, we combined it with sharp debridement. It's known as the gold standard. This is the fastest, most efficient, and we can use uh, multiple uh, instruments to help us with it. One, one of the things I wanted to emphasize for the sharp debridement is adequate sharp debridement. And oftentimes this actually requires patient education as well as the provider education. And, and this is very important because of the edge effect. You know, I, I actually work with many students and residents and when they, when they actually ask me, they go, hey, you know, as we can see here, this is callous tissue around the womb. And it's important that we actually get to the furthest extent of it. The other thing that you can see, and hopefully my other picture here is, you can can see that by using the forceps here, we're able to kind of lift that tissue. And that's something called undermining. So know that two things that's somewhat unique to diabetic foot ulcers. Number one is the callus formation. Why? Because again, our weight when we're walking is, is our, our feet sustains the weight when we're walking. So whenever there's areas of high pressure, callus is going to form. The other thing is when we're walking, we shift forward. That's why if you ever go buy a shoe, when you buy a shoe, you actually never want to buy a shoe where your big toe is hitting the tip of the shoe. You actually want to leave about an inch. And the reason for that is because when we walk, we actually shift forward a little bit. In, in, in the device itself. And because of that side to side of what's called the shear force, it's very common for the diabetic foot ulcer to have this undermining because that side to side shear force is causing that lifting. So when it's lifting up, the tissue is not good. So we educate not only the, um, the 
the patients and as well as the residents and the students because you know we want to fully we want to use what's called the pinch test to make sure that we've adequately addressed the debridement to remove these undermining tissue and also when we talk to patients too because I've had patients come back very angry they see this as oh I'm healing look my wound is getting smaller and we actually have to explain to the patient no this is not good tissue and I often take pictures to show it's like look if this is lifting up if I'm able to do this it's not good tissue so that the patient is aware that we need to debride that um, necrotic or fibrotic tissue these undermined tissue in order for them to heal better otherwise we've had patients come back and get very angry at us thinking aha I'm almost healed why did you this you're a bad doctor for making my wound bigger when no this is something that we need to do we have to do the adequate um, wound heal or adequate debridement in order to remove these tissue that is um, either calloused or not attached because of undermining so that the wound can granulate and epithelialize properly. Now, having said that, we know that Debridement is a very important step when it comes to wound healing. You see it in multiple guidelines and algorithms. <laughs> but we need to be considerate of the anatomy because when it comes to the foot, there are many superficial tendons. So when we debride, we want to be careful. We don't want to just start you know, becoming aggressive and not realize that we may cut into somebody's tendon or cut, cut into somebody's um, um, Mess, uh, muscles. We also need to check patients' vascularity. So for those who do not have adequate vascularity, we must check. What we want to make sure that we refer them to a vascular surgeon and the patient has vascular adi um, adequate vascularity before we do these aggressive type debridements. We also need to be careful with the degree of the immunocompromise of the patients, as well as if they're on anticoagulants. You know, I'll provide an example. I, I worked with a fellow actually who was very excited to start doing the aggressive debridements. He was so excited that he failed to look in the chart to see that the patient actually had factor was factor seven deficient had hemophilia and the the you know my fellow started debriding and no matter what he did the patient would not stop bleeding and and it wasn't eventually until he looked into the charts like oh goodness they needed the factor seven so we had to go and order from the a specific department to get the anticoagulants for the patient to stop bleeding. So definitely read up the patient's chart. Do not make the mistake that my fellow did because, you know, these mistakes happen. So we need to be careful. We also need to keep in mind the urgency when there's a um, infection, ascending cellulitis. These are medical emergencies. When there's gas in the tissue, we have to um, do the debridement immediately because of these urgent type of cases. And of course, to receive appropriate training prior to doing the debridement. Admit. The next thing I really want to emphasize is the pressure on the ulcer. So down on the bottom, you can see the movie clip of somebody with a diabetic foot ulcer. And it's played in slow mode, but what you can see is these peak pressures that is on the foot when the patient is walking. So by looking at this itself, you can see there's a peak pressure in the heel and then really in the ball of the foot area. Because of that, you know, the fact that we're bipedal and our weight goes from the heel to the ball of the foot, that's why these two are the areas where we most commonly see diabetic foot ulcers. It's in reaction to the pressure. And when we look at these pressure, it's not just the pressure itself. It's actually, we look at the um, amount of pressure or the stress per step on times the number of steps that the patient is taking. Because of this formula, because if you think about it, if we're able to somehow chain the, the patient to a bed, the patient's foot never touches the ground, or somehow we are able to make the patient float where the foot never touches the ground, it doesn't matter how deformed the foot is, that pressure is not there and they will, they will heal. And, and in terms of you know, research and just a little tangent here, a lot of the research is actually looking at the number of steps because are we able to modify the number of steps a patient take to help decrease the stress itself? But when we talk about offloading, one of the things I really emphasize to the patient, and I use a tire as an example. It's like, hey, when you, your foot is, is kind of similar to the tires of a car. 
right? And when you've got an ulcer, it's like um, similar to a tire getting a flat. So what happens when we get a flat tire? Well, we want to go and get it fixed right away because if we don't, we're going to damage the rim of the tire if we continue to drive on it. And the, the rims are very, very expensive to, to fix. Well, when it comes to diabetic foot ulcer, getting an ulcer, superficial ulcer, it's like getting a flat. If the patient continues to walk on it instead of coming in to get treatment, it's going to get deeper and the underlying bone may get damaged. And hopefully with this analogy, we try to emphasize to patients the need to come in earlier. You know, when we talk about pressure, know that this is not something that's new. Even back in 1963, Bowman and Brand, they, they were looking at the pressure that is on the bottom of the foot. And even then, they were looking at the various offloading capacity of these different types of shoes. So this, this picture here was the shoe that they advocated back in 1963. Since then, there are many different ways for us to offload the foot that is available. Now, depending on where you're at, there may be devices that you have available that we don't. There's different devices. But really what I kind of want to emphasize on is it's not necessarily the device. It's really the patient compliance to the device that, that helps them heal. And again, going back to my comment earlier about the callus formation, that is one way for us to know whether the patient is adequately offloaded, because if they are, they should have minimal callus formation. If they're coming back with a lot of callus every time you see them, they're not being adequately debrided. Now, when we look at the pressure, right, one of the things that we can look at is peak pressure. And peak pressure, it, it's going to happen when the, when the heel touches the ground, it's going to have a lot of pressure because it's the first step down. And when the toe, toe goes off, what we call the toe off, you're going to see higher pressure. It's not always, though, just that slight second of the highest pressure. It's actually this pressure time interval. It can be of moderate pressure here, but because of that sustained period of time that the patient has that elevated pressure, not necessarily the highest, that actually may be the cause of the ulcer formation. And when we look at the different ways to offload, of course, total contact casting is uh, considered the gold standard. So by comparing on the y-axis here, we have the percentage of pressure reduction compared to a canvas Oxford shoe. And you can see on the bottom here, the x-axis, we have three locations, the first met, uh, second to fifth met, and the helix. You can see in a total contact cast, it actually takes the pressure off by at least 80%. Now here, these are the yellow lines represent the various removable cast walkers that, that is out there. And you can see that, you know, some of them actually kind of offload just as well, if not better than the total contact cast. Others may be slightly less, but you can see that at least 55% of the pressure is being taken off. However, we'll look at in a minute, because of patient noncompliance, they don't have as good record. The one that would not be recommended for patients when it comes to wounds is you do not want to put them in an extra depth shoe, not for wound healing, because as you can see here in the red, it only offloads anywhere between 10 to to maybe about 30% depending on the location. So why is it that the total contact cast, even though it's got the offloading is somewhat similar to these removable cast walkers, it's got a much better healing rate? Well, it's really because any of the other devices, the patient can take it off. It's really the lack of adherence. And then looking at the studies that we performed earlier, patients only, if you allow them um, this compliance, patients only wear these offloading devices about 28% of the time. And for the most part, you know, oftentimes it has actually has a lot to do with how the patient think. They believe, and they will come back and tell you and say, doctor, I've not been walking. And it's because when they're home where they feel it's safe in their environment, they would often take whatever device that we put on, they, they would take it off and they would walk around at home thinking, I'm not really walking, I'm home, not realizing that these patients take the most number of steps when they're home. I've got a case example to show what happened in one of our patients, where, you know, the patient was 
in essence, being non-compliant, but not realizing that the patient was being non-compliant. And this is data actually out of Australia in 2014, which shows you can see here on the x-axis, you know, all these offloading devices and actually the per small, you know, percentage of time that these, they're actually being compliant with it. So know that this is an issue not just limited to, say, the United States. This is an issue that is worldwide, and we have to be cognizant so, you know, in going forward, we want to think when we are offloading the patient with whatever device that we're using, it's really not necessarily will the device work for the wound, but will it work for the patient as well in terms of compliance? And this will actually, um, these factors will help us improve, you know, whatever the design is for the patient, as well as the need to educate the patient so the patient better understand, no, this is not just for when you're outside, when you're home, anytime your foot is touching the ground, you have to put it on. So here um, is actually from um, Alberto Piagassi study where they demonstrated by the effectiveness of offloading. And you can see here by the histopathology slides, when we provide these removable offloading devices, the wound actually is nowhere near as healthy. They do not heal compared to the wounds that were in these irremovable devices, such as the total contact cast. You know, one of the other offloading, because I know we emphasize a lot on the plantar aspect of the foot, oftentimes we actually may need to offload between the toes as well. And it's important to educate the patient so that they better understand why, because we do not see the patient that often. We often see the patient maybe once a week, sometimes multiple times a week, but uh, it's important for the patient to understand or their family to understand so that when they get home, they can employ the offloading as well. So this is a 59-year-old male type 2 diabetes, peripheral arterial disease. In fact, this patient is not, this patient has a lot of infrapopliteal calcification. All, all of this patient's blood vessels have calcified so that this patient actually is not a good um, surgical candidate. So never smoker, social drinker, you can see the meds there. And the patient actually developed the wound when he was vacationing in Mexico. They put him on antibiotics, but this is the wound when I first saw it. And oftentimes when you see patients with diabetes, You'll, you'll see that their toes are actually very much stuck together. They're, they're, you, you, you can't pull it apart. It's actually very difficult to, to pull it apart. Never mind the fact that oftentimes they may be wearing tight fitting shoes, but the toes themselves are together. So much so that this actually wound occurred because of the joint, the um, interphalangeal joint from the next toe, because the toes were so tight together, it was pushing against um, this area of this toe so that it was causing the wound. So you can see here, I'm actually bending the distal interphalangeal joint here. And you can see that if I let go, it was pressing against the area. So one of these things that we employ to offload the area is you want to put, so in our case, we use um, lamb's wool because that's the best, best way to put in between the toes. If you don't have that, even a tiny small piece of gauze is able. So what you want to do is I'm going to use my hand to demonstrate. You actually want to put something in between between the toes. So you can see that I have a hard time putting my fingers together and you can see where my two um, interphalangeal joint, they're not able to press. Whereas generally, if you let the patient go, the, the interphalangeal joints are closer together and they cause many of these in-between toe ulcers so much so that they end up with osteomyelitis fairly quickly and they end up with these toe amputations. Well, so we, we did that, we instructed the patient. Initially, you can see it looks like it's healing very nicely. And then when the patient came back again, we're noticing, oh, wait, it looks like it's going a step in the in the wrong direction. And when we saw the patient again over the holidays, it looked like it actually kind of got a little worse. Well, what ended up happening was, you know, during the holidays, the family were not the patient, first of all, is cannot reach his toes. He has no feeling because of the neuropathy. So the patient was unaware. And the family, because they were not paying as much attention to the patient, they allowed that piece of gauze to kind of migrate up so much so that instead of helping, it was really in the way. So we really re-educated the patient and the family and say, no, you have to make sure you need to check the patient several times a day to make sure it does, it does not get dislodged, that this area does not touch 
that toe. And then slowly you can see in time that the, the patient actually healed because of offloading. Um, we, again, did not put anything fancy on the wound. Just with taking that pressure off, you can see that the wound actually um, started to heal. And in this patient, we were fortunate because we caught it early enough that the x-rays and MRI were negative for osteomyelitis. And we were able to really essentially salvage the toe just strictly with offloading. And again, teaching the patient's family multiple times to ensure that they understand the concept. So you can see just with the progression and again, demonstrating the, and the, here's the patient on uh, several months after to, to maintain. And we, we actually suggest that they continue to do that, to offload the toe, to space out the toe, to maintain that offloading of the area so that it does not reoccur. And here's another case where it's a 63-year-old female. Now, in this case, this patient actually does not have diabetes. However, this patient has peripheral neuropathy. And um, she really acts very similar to somebody who may have um, diabetes because of the neuropathy. Now, what complicates this patient is because of the lymphedema. So it becomes very difficult for this patient to offload. So this is a patient's wound when we first saw the wound. And the, one of the issues with this patient because of the lymphedema is this patient weighs about 457 pounds. And it's difficult to offload because this patient has very poor balance. And as you can see, the leg is extremely big and doesn't really fit in any of the devices that we may have. So it was important after we debride the wound that we emphasize, hey, this is on your heel. You can see, remember my, my video where it showed um, the, the high pressure when the, when the patient's walking. Um, and we emphasize that, hey, you do not want to walk on this. You want to make sure that there's no weight on this. Now, this particular patient stays at a nursing facility, and it was emphasized that. But as you can see from the next few pictures is every time we see the patient, there, there really wasn't a, a dramatic change right, to, to the patient's wound. What's, what's, you know, so, so we're thinking, okay, what, what is going on with this patient? Why, why is it, you know, it's, we, we, it looks like it's adequately debrided. It looks like what's going on. So we took an x-ray and we compared it to the original one and, and, and MR, subsequent MRI because the x-ray looks suspicious. And you can see that the patient actually developed osteomyelitis to the area. So we subsequently took the patient to surgery, removed the area, packed it with antibiotic beads along with IV antibiotics for the patient. And again, we um, um, requested that the patient not be not be put be put on weight bearing. And then in speaking with a nursing facility, what we learned was this patient, even though she was to be non-weight bearing, she was taking bathroom trips. And remember, she's got lymphedema. She's put on these diuretics that actually makes her go to the bathroom several times a day because they're trying to remove the, the water from her lymphedema. She was actually putting a lot of weight on her foot. And then once why I actually said, no, strict non-weight bearing, she essentially was um, we had physical therapy come and work with her, so to, to um, so she actually had some motion, but we did not allow her um, left foot to be on the ground. So, and you can see the power of just the offloading, and by enforcing that strict offloading, enforcing that compliance, you can see in just about a month the wound actually uh, started epitheliizing, and here it is a month later, and you can see, and the patient actually has uh, this just happened about two weeks ago. And the plan is to have the patient maintain a non-weight bearing for about six weeks additional before we actually fit the patient for a shoe. Now, one of the trickier thing about this patient is because of the lymphedema and the different sizes is to really work with a good prosthesis to, to find a shoe that actually would work for the patient. So this brings us to question two, what can we do to make this wound heal faster? So when we look at this wound continuum where we've got these stalled wounds and we're trying to heal them too so that they start to heal, we must really get rid of many of the factors and slowly kind of convert the factors. Depending on the wound, of course, if it's an infected wound, we want to decrease it so that it becomes colonized. And eventually it's a clean wound that can really start epithelializing. If the patient has peripheral arterial disease, you know, we want to have the patient assess and refer the patient accordingly so that 
that they can have adequate blood flow to heal. And same thing with necrotic wounds and whether it's a dry wound or it's a wet wound, we want to manage that to really kind of start that healing continuum for the patient. And again, back to really our message about diabetic foot management, where we want to maximize their healing potential. Of course, First, if it's significant infection ischemia, we must address that immediately. Deep wounds converted to superficial wounds. And then the next step when it comes to what to put on is we want to help convert these fibrinous necrotic wounds to granular wounds. And of course, employ debridement to convert the chronic wounds into acute wounds. So when we're looking at the wound status, we must first determine how granular, oftentimes it's a mix, it's not clear. We can see, okay, a mix of granular and fibrinous tissue and um, a percent of per certain percentage of necrotic tissue. And what can we do to help convert that? If it's a purely granular wound, then we can look at exudate sensitive dressings. How much is the exudate? You know, perhaps put on collagen to help uh, with the wound, um, to help with wound granulation. And if it's fibrinous necrotic wounds, do we need to either do more sharp debridements, enzymatic debridements to, to help with the patient? Now, when it comes to managing these granular wounds, we can look at optimizing the wound in terms of the exudate. We want a moist wound. We don't want a heavily draining wound, nor do we want a dry wound. So you can see that there's actually a lot of overlap. But for those who's got minimal exudate, you know, maybe just collagen or even a non-adherent dressing, as I showed in previous examples, by doing good basic wound care, we're able to um, jumpstart that epithelialization process, jumpstart that granulation process. If it's minimal to moderate exudate, you know, perhaps some alginate and foams to help. And if it's moderately to heavy, you know, definitely alginate, maybe even a hydrofiber to help us manage the, the wound to maintain, a, a, the key is really to maintain that moist wound environment. And then question number three, what can we do to prevent reoccurrence? Knowing that about 60% of these wounds actually recur in about a year, it's important for us to educate the patient so that they have good glycemic control. They're monitoring their feet because once you have a wound, the recurrence rate is very high and they have to have early recognition, come in to see us earlier instead of waiting until they've got an infection going on. And it's important to continue to offload the foot. And in this case, once healed with extra depth shoes, rocker bottom shoes, accommodative uh, diabetic inserts to help, and then followed by regular follow-ups with us um, based on um, risk factor guidelines. And then in cases where patients have very large um, areas of pressure, we may consider recommending the patient for elective surgery to preemptively reduce that pressure area so that it may help prevent reoccurrence as well. And with that, I really just kind of wanted to end with this quote from the Edinburgh Medical and Surgical Journal. You know, you can see here that it was actually published in 1805, and they talked about on the treatment of these ulcerated legs. And they said actually back then, recognizing that more credit is due to the surgeon who saves one limb than to him who amputates 20, because dexterity in operating is only secondary in merit to the skills in healing. So way back then, they recognize that, yes, it is a battle. It is very difficult to um, heal these wounds, but, you know, kudos and more credit to those who do because it's um, by doing this, we know we're benefiting not only the patients themselves, but their family as we're able to do limb salvage and continue to help these patients progress. Us, the numbers of diabetes continue to increase. And, you know, this actually just makes our work even more worthwhile. And really kudos to all of you who are on with me today for all the hard work that you do. And it takes a lot of determination. And, and I know that. And oftentimes it's difficult, especially with different patient circumstances, but to definitely to kind of hang in there and push through. And with that, I will stop sharing and entertain any questions anybody may have. <clears throat> so thank you, Dr. Stephanie, for this wonderful talk. It was very extensive and uh, you covered all the aspects of wound care and offloading 